Welcome back to the Road to Fly 28 MCAT test prep course. For our next topic, we're going to cover the concepts of isomers and configuration. This video is the first in a two-part series covering these topics. Today we're going to focus on the concept of what is an isomer and follow up with the different types of configurations that will show up on the MCAT. These topics are very high yield on the exam, so I highly recommend sticking around for this one as well as the next video. And with that, let's begin. Now first off, let's start off with the definition of an isomer. An isomer is a compound that shares the same molecular formula with another compound, but they have differing structures. So for example, let's draw out n-hexane. An isomer for this molecule will look something like this. Or something like this. What I just drew are isomers, but they're specifically called structural isomers or they're also known as constitu constitutional isomers. These isomers share the molecular formula of the original compound, but they only share the molecular formula. Structure does not matter with these compounds, or with these isomers. They're the easiest isomers to notice on test day, and they're also the most varied. They all have different types of physical and chemical properties. Physical and chemical properties are both topics that will be discussed on the MCAT with respect to isomerism. So if you see physical or chemical properties, Think structural isomers. Physical properties are processes that don't change the composition of matter. So when you think about physical properties, think of stuff like melting points, boiling points, solubility, color, odor, and density. Chemical properties, on the other hand, they're properties that do change the composition of your molecule. So this often occurs when there is a change in the configuration of your functional groups in your molecule. So when you think about chemical properties, think of changes in functional groups. Now, speaking of configuration, let's start looking at that. Uh, configuration refers to the spatial alignment of groups in a molecule. Absolute configuration describes the exact arrangement of the groups in the isomer, while relative configuration describes their arrangement with respect to another chiral molecule. Keep these definitions in mind so that you understand what they're asking you on test day if they show up on a question. Don't worry about chirality just yet. I know I just brought that up, but I'll be discovering, I'll be uh, talking about that in depth on the next video. Now that we understand the basics of configuration though, let's move on to some specific cases that we will see on test day. We'll start off with E and Z forms. E and Z nomenclature is used on compounds with double bonds. E forms have two high priority functional groups on opposite sides of the double bond, while Z forms have them on the same side. We find these high functional groups or high priority functional groups by looking at the atomic number present on these groups. The higher the atomic number, the higher the priority. So let's look at this compound really quick. We can see that uh, iodine has the highest atomic number, so this will be the highest priority group. Same thing with this compound. Fluorine has the highest atomic number, so it's the highest priority functional group. If atomic numbers end up being equal, we would move on to the next atom from each previous atom. So if we look at this molecule, we see that there are two carbons attached, but this one only is attached to three hydrogens, as opposed to this one, which is attached to another carbon. So this would be, this would actually be the higher priority functional group, as this atomic number will be higher moving on to the next group. Uh, for this one, similar thought process. So you can see this one uh, is only attached to three hydrogens, so we wouldn't be considering that as a high functional group or high priority functional group. This one is attached to a carbon with two hydrogens, and it's moving on to another carbon with two hydrogens, so on until it completes the chain. While this one is attached to a carbon that has attached to no hydrogen, but instead three other hydrogens, or sorry, three other carbons. 
So as a result, this will actually be the second highest uh, functional group. I put a, a two here for some reason. I apologize. This is the first. Uh, this is the highest uh, priority functional group. So now that we've discovered the two highest functional groups, or two highest priority functional groups, we now will look for to see their location with respect to the double bond. So if they're on the same side, there will be called Z compounds. So like this one. This will be named as two I Z two iodo. 2 hexane. So you would start, you would just start put a Z in front of the name. If they're on opposite sides, however, they're called E compounds. This one is an E compound. It'll be called E3 fluoro 3 terp butyl 2 hexane. So you would add an E when you were naming this molecule. That's pretty much it when it comes to naming and recognizing E and Z compounds. Please remember that E is opposite sides and Z is same. That's the most important thing you can take away from this, uh, from this type of configuration. So moving on from E and Z forms, let's look at R and S forms. So for this one, I'll start off with, uh, with drawing off an example. RNS forms are used for finding chiral centers in compounds. Right now, I'll cover how to find chiral centers. In the next video, I'm going to explain the significance of finding chirality and what it is. We follow three steps to find chirality in molecules. The first step we take is assigning priority. Assigning priority is just like how we did before with E and Z isomers. So for this example right here, we would call the chlorine the most prioritized molecule. Following that, we call the C2, CH2, CH3 group here as a second highest priority. Third one, we would be this methyl group here, and the last one would be hydrogen. We've assigned numbers to these. So once we have these groups labeled, we will be moving on to the uh, next step. We are going to arrange them in space. Arranging them in space takes some practice and involves orienting the molecule in your head. It can be very difficult at first, but I have an easy method that you can use to uh, discover uh, to, I have an easy method, sorry, that you can use to do it quickly and accurately. So let's start with the fourth group and keep it at the bottom of our diagram. So the fourth one will be hydrogen, so let's just keep it here. We'll just we label it at four. Now let's add the first group on top. That's gonna be the, the front of the molecule, and this is gonna be the back. So now that we see that this is in the front, we're gonna orient the uh, second and third with respect to it. So now that we have these labeled in space, we can now draw a circle around them. We just start from the one and we would circle around to four. We see that four is obviously in the back, so we can just ignore that for now and we can just draw a circle. We can just draw a circle like this. Now, once we have that set up, we can determine if it's an R or S isomer. Counterclockwise rotating compounds are S compounds, while clockwise rotating compounds are R compounds. An easy way I remember this is by writing out the letters R and S. R looks like it would rotate clockwise. R looks like this, right? It looks like it rotates clockwise, so I would say that that would be R. Uh, that, that's how I would remember that. Well, S looks like it rotates counterclockwise. So if we draw it like this, you can see it looks like that. So if you draw it out like this, it's a good way to remember uh, which one is uh, clockwise and which one's counterclockwise. So now that we have that configuration, we can finally name this molecule. It is named just like it normally would be, but you would add R or S in parentheses before it. So 
Since it's going around like that, we would call this S2 chlorobutane. Now that we covered the basics of isomers and configuration, let's end off this video by covering the other types of isomers. This will be the focus of the next video, but it is still important, it's still a good idea to be exposed to them right now, and it'll help you think about them before you watch the next one. Feel free to screenshot this visual, by the way, it's very useful for studying for the MCAT. Uh, as we discussed before, we have structural uh, or constitutional isomers. I covered that today. So, like I said, we have structural constitutional isomers. They only share the molecular formula, and they can also be differentiated even further based on their differing functional groups, locations of their substitute, or substituents, or their skeletal makeups. So these three right here. Uh, however, I, these, will, these will likely not show up on test day. If the compounds share the molecular formula, and they are connected, uh, and the atoms are connected in the same way, and they're called stereoisomers. This is going to be the focus of the, of the next video. These are isomers are the most tested kinds of isomers on the exam. And we'll break them down right now but for some more clarification. A stereoisomer can be interconverted through the rotation of single bonds. It's known as a conformational isomer. If they can't be converted through rotation, they're called configurational isomers. If a configurational isomer has restricted rotation, it's referred to as a cis-trans isomer. So right here. They're also known as geometric isomers. And if it, these do not display uh, optical activity. Or sorry, these, if they don't if they display optical activity, then they are referred to as optical isomers. Optical isomers can be broken down based on whether they have superimposable mirror images. If they are, then they are called enantiomers. And if they do not, they're called diastereomers. I'm gonna stop right here for this video. I've covered the essentials of isomers configuration, and I've introduced you all to the different types of isomers. Next video, we're going to go into detail and discuss conformational isomers, configurational isomers, uh, enantiomers, diastereomers, and chirality. If you enjoyed this video and learned from it, please feel free to leave a like and subscribe. I'll be uploading several other videos about organic chemistry and the MCAT. Thank you all for watching, and I will see you all next time.